I would say that even if evolution is true, let's say I'm wrong, let's say B he is wrong, and evolution, macroevolution in fact, is true, I would say if that's the case, it still doesn't prove that there is no God. So let's go down that path here for just a few minutes. Now, if evolution is true, I don't believe it is, but let's say I'm wrong and macroevolution actually does take place, it might weaken the design of life argument, okay? I say might, may weaken, but maybe not. Take a look at this quote from Stephen Barr. This is another scientist, physics professor at the University of Delaware that I've told you about in prior weeks. But look at what he says in response to this idea. Paley, William Paley, finds a watch and asks how such a thing could have come to be there by chance. Dawkins, evolutionary scientist Richard Dawkins, finds an immense automated factory evolutionary process that blindly constructs watches and feels that he's completely answered Paley's point, the design argument for God. But that's absurd. How can a factory that makes watches be less in need of an explanation than the watches themselves? Darwinian evolution, if it's true, far from disproving the necessity of a cosmic designer, may actually point to it. We now have the problem of explaining not merely a butterfly's wing, but a universe that can produce a butterfly's wing. I think also, uh, even if macroevolution is true, let's say, we can also push back this way. We can also, also push back in the sense that evolution can explain the origin of life. Think about it for a moment. Even if macroevolution is true, that process can't even begin unless there is life which is up and going, that is reproducing, that is not only reproducing, but reproducing organisms that have variations among themselves. Natural selection would have, as Darwin said, as we saw earlier, natural selection would have, enough, would have nothing to latch onto if that process isn't already up and going. If there's life reproducing that has offspring, which has variation. Natural selection can't do anything unless that's already up and going. And so natural selection, macroevolution can explain how that process came about. Does that make sense? Which might be the, the most complex thing about life. The fact that it can reproduce and have offspring with variations. Macroevolution cannot explain how that process came about. In other words, the origin of life can still be developed as a design argument for the existence of God. Because that has to be up and going before macroevolution could even begin to work if it is true. Regardless, you know, even if, let's say, evolution knocks out the design argument for God based on biological life, I don't think it has, but even if it did, we still have many other good arguments for the existence of God. There's the design argument of the universe, the fine-tuning argument, which we talked about last week, probably the most powerful argument for the existence of God, plus many others, the moral argument, the first cause argument, the ontological argument. So even if evolution is true, I do not think that it would prove there is no God. Now maybe a more interesting question for you is as follows. Even though macroevolution wouldn't prove that there is no God, would it prove that Christianity is false? Now in this process of me presenting apologetics, as I've explained before, I'm kind of doing it from ground zero, right? So I'm, when I do this for a large audience, um, I don't know where everybody's at, so I start with the existence of God, and we build a case for Christianity. So we haven't made the case for Christianity yet, right? In this part, um, so far in the apologetics class, we're just making a case that there's a, a supreme being, an ultimate being, a God that exists, right? However, I would guess most of the people in this room are Christians, and so I think it's worthwhile spending the last few minutes here discussing this question. Yes, macroevolution, if it's true, would not prove that there is no God, but would it prove that Christianity is false? So let's discuss that here for just a little bit. I want to be really careful here 
and not confuse anybody, so I'll restate again that I think macroevolution is false. I think it's a mistake. But we want to consider what it would mean if we're wrong, and in fact, it is true. Now, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart because I've worked with a lot of young people over the years who have grown up in Christian homes, Christian churches, and for whatever reason, maybe it's because they go to university, maybe it's because they go into the field of science in their studies, they become convinced that evolution is true. I disagree with them. I think they're wrong, but for whatever reason, they come to that conclusion. Unfortunately, a lot of them think that they have to give up their Christianity. They think if they adopt evolution, if they become convinced that it's true for whatever reason, therefore then they have to give up their Christian beliefs. And I would argue that that's not in fact the case. Okay, So I'm going to do this very carefully here and run through this exact same process that we did with the existence of God. So first of all, I would say, look, if evolution is false, then certainly it doesn't prove that Christianity is false. And then again, make the argument that evolution is false, as we've done already. However, I think I can do this as well, and this is the last thing we'll do this morning. I think the last point here is that we can argue even if evolution is true, it still doesn't prove that Christianity is false. I would say that if evolution is true, some of us might have to rethink how we interpret some aspects of Scripture. We might have to uh, move to more of an uh, Augustinian or C.S. Lewis interpretation of some aspects of uh, our interpretation of Scripture, but that's completely different than rejecting all of Christianity, okay? It's important to keep in mind that there are primary beliefs within our Christian belief system and secondary beliefs, okay? And so if, let's say, a scientific discovery would disprove one of our secondary beliefs, um, that is a whole lot different than our primary beliefs being disproven. So I would say, for example, my position would be, if for whatever reason I became convinced someday that macroevolution is true, that would adjust some of my theological beliefs, some of my interpretations of Scripture, some aspects of Scripture, but it wouldn't touch at all my primary Christian beliefs. I would just move to more of a C.S. Lewis or church father, uh, St. Augustine's understanding of maybe a less literal interpretation of the first couple chapters of Genesis. Now, I'm not there. I reject evolution, and I have more of a literal understanding of the first few chapters of Genesis. But if I moved in that direction, I wouldn't have to give up my primary Christian beliefs. I would just have to adjust some of my secondary ones. It's important to know that there are Christians who have made this move already. One of the most well-known ones is Francis Collins. He led the Human Genome Project, nominated by our president to be the director of the National Institutes of Health. He's uh, one of the, our country's most famous scientist, scientists, but he's a Christian. He affirms evolution. He wrote a book, The Language of God, a scientist presents evidence for belief, but he's also founded an or organization called BioLogos and advocates that Christianity and evolution can be reconciled, that God created life as we know it through a macroevolutionary process. Now, I disagree with him. I respectfully disagree with my brother in Christ here, but I don't want to villainize him. You know, I don't want to accuse him of being a heretic or not a real Christian because he disagrees with me over a secondary issue. The last thing I want to point out is that sometimes science can, in fact, help us interpret the Bible better. Now, I don't think this has happened in the case of macroevolution, okay? I'm just explaining what some Christians have done and what I would do if I became convinced someday that macroevolution is in fact true. But I will point out that there are things in the past, there are situations in the past where science has helped us interpret the Bible better. And let me just run through this um, chart real quick, because I think this, this helps a lot of people understand what's going on. Because a knee-jerk reaction that I find a lot of Christians having is that science is just man's thinking and science can never help us 
to understand uh, God's word better. But that's not, in fact, the case. I'll show you an example from history where science has actually improved our interpretation of scripture. And so we don't just want to put our heads in the sand and ignore what the scientists are discovering and saying. I think in, store, in order to understand this conversation, it's important to remember that God communicates to us in two ways, right? We've talked about this in terms of general revelation and special revelation. We've got scripture and we've got nature or creation, if you will. Now, if Christianity is true, and I believe it is, there's no conflict between these two things, right? General revelation and God's special revelation, scripture and creation communicate truth to us, and there's never a conflict between those two things. However, we have to interpret both of these things, right? We're finite, fallen human beings who don't know everything, and we're trying to figure out what is really true. And so we have to go through a process of interpreting both of these things. What we call them, we call our interpretation, first of all, of nature, we call our interpretation of that science, and we call our interpretation of scripture theology, right? So we have to interpret both of these things. And sometimes there is conflict between our science and our theology, right? That has happened many times. Now, when A and B conflict, when science and theology conflict, as it does right now with macroevolution and some of our literal theological beliefs of the couple, first couple chapters of Genesis, if there's a conflict there, what could have gone wrong? Well, obviously the interpretation could have gone wrong, either on the scientific side or on the theological side. We can make mistakes in both areas of interpretation, right? And so we have to think through, you know, which interpretation has gone wrong if there is conflict between A and B. Well, what's an example of when science has actually helped us interpret the Bible better? Let me give you that example and we'll be done this morning. Well, you might know that in the past, um, most theologians interpreted several verses throughout the Old, Testable, the Old Testament to mean that the earth uh, stayed put. Especially there's some verses in the book of Psalms that talk about the earth being firm. And theologians for centuries interpreted that to mean that the earth does not move. The earth is stationary and the sun goes around the earth. That was the theological interpretation of those verses. But as we know, science discovered that that's not correct. Science has shown that in fact, no, it's the sun that doesn't move and the earth goes around the sun. Now the theologians had a very difficult time giving up those interpretations and fought against it and fought against it. And you know all the fights with the church and Galileo, so on and so forth. But eventually the theologians had to eat their humble pie and admit that the science has shown their interpretations were incorrect. And so I think it's helpful for us to think through this process and make sure that we're not, again, putting our heads in the sand and just rejecting science because it's man's thoughts and realize that no, sometimes science can help us improve our interpretation of scripture.